where Jesus spoke in parables. We used yeah. to catch a radio broadcast every <laughs> afternoon, every weekday afternoon in Maryland called Stories of Great Christians. And they would do a biography of somebody that had a really interesting experience. But we watched them, we listened to this on the radio every afternoon. I can remember Jonathan was probably about eight or nine years old. And he makes this pretend microphone, and he's walking through his room going, stories of great chickens. <laughs> All those years, he had heard that he had never heard it say stories of great Christians. He was imitating the announcer, but he thought it was stories of great chickens. <laughs> there he says, that works for me. <laughs> he has some pretty great chickens out there. Sure. Okay, guys, we're going to go ahead and get cranking up here, okay? <clears throat> We're ready to go in? Yeah. Go in? We're going now. Okay. Reporting. All right. Well, good to have everybody here this evening. And uh, <clears throat> on occasion, we uh, have some plans to do things uh, on Saturday mornings. And so we're taking the opportunity to get together Friday evening. And so we're glad that you all could make it. And uh, we're uh, praying that you'll have a nice respite tomorrow. And you'll enjoy the day. <clears throat> but at any rate, we uh, want to just pause for a few moments and go to the Lord in prayer before we get started. So I'd like we to do have some ahead. special prayer, prayer requests. Because the area that we're going to is dead center for where the storm is supposed to stall. And the news that I just saw said this storm system could top the record-breaking storm of 1933 that produced all kinds of flooding in that area of the mm -hmm. East Coast. <clears throat> so that's not a great scenario for a wedding mm -hmm. or for traveling across the state and back. Right. So, we're so we want to pray that storm off the coast, <laughs> out to the South Sea. Mm -hmm. You're laughing, but he can do it. Mm -hmm. Hey, if he could make that car run all those miles well, without any yeah. minutes, he can go yeah. to a hurricane. <laughs> okay. No big deal to him. <clears throat> we do want to see Larry showing up here all the time. Yeah. <laughs> That's a miracle. Yeah. Same thing with a hurricane. It's a hemicane. It's a hemicane. Larry King. Okay. Well, let me just invite you to bow your heads with me. Pause for a minute. Father in heaven, we want to thank you uh, most graciously for your many blessings. We thank you that you have. Uh, <coughs> Allow us to come together on a Friday evening here at the beginning of your Sabbath. We uh, ask in a very special way, Lord, that you would be with us. We, we come seeking in, insight, understanding, knowledge. You <clears throat> are the only source, and so we, we need to rely on you, Lord, as we open your book. So thank you for coming and being with us in a very special way. Also, we do have a special request this evening, uh, and there are could be many things on each person's heart, but one thing that we want to lift up to you is uh, our plans for tomorrow and the area that we're going to be traveling to. We know that the weather forecast is calling for potentially record-breaking rains and flooding and so forth. We're going to ask in a special sense, Lord, that you might, <clears throat> might uh, blow that out to sea, uh, particularly out of harm's way for the millions of people that it might affect. So <clears throat> we're, we're asking, Father, for, for you to work in that regard. Uh, we know that you are a God of miracles. We know that you can make things happen. We know that you care about your children and, of course, everyone. And so, Father, we uh, simply ask in the name of Jesus that you would accomplish that. And, and also, we're praying that you would be with uh, any special requests that uh, each of us might have as well. You've uh, blessed us throughout the week, and you've brought us here now to uh, reflect on many of the things that you've done for us. And so we're praying and thanking you, Lord, for taking such good care of us. As we open your book and study on the Sermon on the Mount. We pray that those foundational principles will find a, a lodging place deep in our hearts. 
So thank you for the time that we can come together, and the time that we can pray, and the time that we can study. And we do ask that you'll use us in the finishing of your great work. In Jesus' wonderful name, we ask these things. Amen. 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 <clears throat> so ready for chapter 11? Well, last week we talked about the miracle car. <laughs> how it got completely overhauled. <laughs> this is called the third prayer. Driving through the countryside of Western Europe on the way back to Holland, I tried to evaluate the trip I had just finished. I had been gone more than seven weeks. I had traveled nearly 6,000 miles, held nearly 100 meetings, and established scores of contacts for future work. <clears throat> Most important were the conversions, hundreds of them new Christians, men and women and children who were actually living in the kingdom of God, while at the same time living under a government that said there was no God. What was their life going to be like now? It was hard leaving these friends to face pressures and sacrifices that I could only guess at. As for my determination to bring them Bibles, in the clear light of this May morning, it looked a lot harder than it had in the flush of conviction that night in Belgrade. In 1957, there was not a single communist border over which you could take books of any kind, let alone religious books. How was I to get them in? And how was I to distribute them once inside without endangering those who helped me? Which country needed them most? Which should I try first? All these questions bounced back and forth in my mind as I rolled mile after mile across Europe ever closer to home. No, I corrected myself, not home. To Vita, certainly, but in one of those strange flashes of self-knowledge, I realized suddenly that Vita was no longer home to me. That was why I'd been driving so slowly, stopping so frequently to check my maps, take talking crops with every farmer I met. With a start, I realized that ever since I had left Yugoslavia, I had been dawdling, stalling for time against the inevitable moment when I would be alone again in my bachelor's room. After Papa's death, I had moved out of the house and into his little room above the tool shed. It had seemed such a practical idea. The room had a separate entrance and I could come and go without disturbing the household. But the effect of the move had been to emphasize how very much alone I was. It was a loneliness, furthermore, that I now knew to be a permanent part of my life. At a rest stop in Germany, I got out my Bible and opened it to the back cover where I had recorded God's hard answer to a prayer that I had made. I sipped my coffee and remembered the night in Yugoslavia when I had made it. I had been feeling lonely that evening, too. Lord, I said, in a year I'll be 30. You made a help meet for man, and somehow I have not found my own Lord. I'm going to ask you for something, and tonight I ask you for a wife. I'd noted the specific prayer request in my Bible, April 12, 1957, in Nosaki. Prayed for a wife. Beside the notation, I had left a place an answer. And in five days later, I had I'd come in my quiet time, I had suddenly known with uncanny certainty that Isaiah 54 1 was God's reply to me. I flipped excitedly through the pages of the Old Testament and read, the children of the desolate are more than the children of the married. Again and again I read the words, trying to apply themselves to myself, trying to rejoice in God's will. I might feel desolate, but he was going to give me more children, spiritual children, than I could ever have as a flesh and blood father. So I had written the answer beside the request. But now as I drained my coffee cup beside a field of spring flowers, I knew that spiritual children were not all that I had in mind. I wanted real live, noisy, running and jumping children with sticky faces and wooden shoes to mend after the fights. Above all, I wanted a wife, a living, loving human being who would make my life one fabric instead of this patchwork quilt of pieces and people based nowhere, instead of this heading home to no one. Suppose I asked him again, right now, suppose I just opened my Bible anywhere, just let my finger fall where it would and took this new verse for his real answer. I always laughed at people who looked for guidance this way, but it was a glorious spring day when anything could happen, so I closed my eyes, opened the Bible at random and plunged my finger down the page. When I looked down, I could hardly believe my eyes. My finger was pointing to Isaiah 54.1. <laughs> the children of the desolate are more than the children of the married. 
<coughs> I told myself I must have creased the Bible to open to that page from reading it so intently before, but it was no good. Thoroughly chastened, I recorded in the back of the Bible the repeated question and the repeated answer. I don't like the message, Lord, but at least it's clear. So I loaded the portable stove back into the car and started up the motor. It was a long way back to Veta, back to the little room and solitary confinement. The actual homecoming was no better than I had imagined. I sat up in the living room until late at night telling the family about Yugoslavia. Then, when I could put it off no longer, I made my way outside and up the ladder. The little room seemed damp and clammy. There was mildew on the bed sheets. My desk was white and chalky. The new wallpaper was peeling. But then it had always been a wet bear on the folders. It had never bothered me before. Why should it strike me now with such distaste? Over the next six weeks, I threw myself into speaking, writing, praying for the vision of my next step behind the Iron Curtain. I visited the Westras to tell them about the heroic job of the little VW, and I wrote a new series of articles for the magazine. I paid a visit to Carl de Graff and the prayer group at Amersfoort. In general, I kept busy. So busy, I kept telling myself I wouldn't notice how lonely I was. In July, I gave it up. Lord, I said one morning, sitting on the little iron fold-down bed in my room over the tool shed, I've just got to pray one more time about this bachelor life you planned for me. Now I know about those children you promised the desolate, but Lord, you also promised the desolate a home. I quickly found the verse in Psalm 68 as though to refresh his memory. <laughs> God gives the desolate a home to dwell in. It isn't that I don't thank you for this room above the tool shed, Lord. Just because it's dark and dank and mildewy and doesn't mean I'm not grateful. <laughs> but dear God, it's not a home, not really. A home is where there's a wife and children, real ones. Lord, Paul prayed three times for release from the thorn in the flesh that was bothering him, and you refused him. I have prayed two times for a wife. I am now going to pray once more, and perhaps you will refuse me a third time too, Lord. And if you do, I shall never bring up this question again. I'm going to write it here in the back of my Bible. I opened my Bible to the back cover and scribbled one last notation. Prayed for wife, third time. Vida, July 7th, 1957. Then I closed the Bible with a snap. Some people are built for the lonely walk, but not me, please, not me. It wasn't until September that anything happened that I could interpret as an answer. Then one morning, in the middle of my prayer time, a face suddenly floated in front of me. Long blonde hair, a smile that made the sun come out, eyes never the same shade twice. Corey. Corey Van Dam. The thought of her had come to me so unexpectedly, so completely independent of what I was thinking at the moment, that I wondered with a leap of my heart if, she, if the thought was God's, if he was showing me beyond the wildest dream to answer to my prayers. But how could it be? Friends and teammates though we had been, I had never once considered Corey fair game for dating. She was a child, still in her teens. But that was how many years ago? Four years since I'd left the factory for England and she left for nursing school. Why, she was grown up now. She had doubtless finished school and married by now, though. From being the little girl barely out of her pinafore, Corey suddenly became for me a very adult woman, who, if she was not already married, was choosing this very moment among a crowd of pushy, clamoring suitors. Within the hour, I was in Alkmaar, driving down the street where Corey's folks lived. We had often come there after our youth weekends and Mrs. Van Dam would serve coffee and cookies while Mr. Van Dam draped the ceiling with smoke from an enormous pipe. I didn't exactly know what I would do when I got to the house. Just look at it, I guessed. Make sure it was still there. Or maybe go to the door. Mrs. Van Dam, I wonder if you would give me Corey's address. Let's suppose it was Corey herself who opened the door. Hello, Corey. Are you married? If not, will you marry me? <laughs> I reached the house before I'd settled on a plan, and right away I knew I wouldn't need one. The shutters were closed over the windows, the garden high with weeds. A lump gnawing at my stomach, I drove on to the factory. No, Mr. Ringers hadn't heard where the Van Dams had gone. Corey? Why, she'd taken her training in St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Harlem. Might still be there, for all he knew. No, if she was married, he hadn't heard about it. His eyes just twinkled as he answered my questions. It'll be a lucky man, Andy, who marries that young lady. 
It was wonderful how much urgent business I suddenly discovered in Harlem. <laughs> Bible stores to visit, church invitations that I had inexcusably neglected, people to see, a wonderful city. From a filling station just outside, I telephoned St. Elizabeth and held my breath while the receptionist looked up Corey's file. Yes, the voice came back. She's a final year student. Miss Van Dam, my sigh of relief stopped her for a moment. <laughs> Miss Van Dam is living in a private home this year away from the residence. She gave me the address and told me that the apartment was the top floor of a private house in the nicest section of town. The owner was a wealthy elderly woman, the lady at the hospital said, who gave the apartment in return for having a nurse in the house. After a search, I found the street and quickly spotted Corey's windows high up under the eaves. The whole house was built like a miniature castle. Corey's room opened onto a balcony topped with a tiny peak turret. I parked the car down the street and gave myself up to daydreams. She was the queen in the castle and I was a knight in armor. She was Juliet and when she appeared from her balcony I would step forward. But she didn't appear, either on the balcony or anywhere else. The afternoon passed and darkness came, but no light appeared in Corey's rooms. Abandoning all pretext of subtlety, I went up to the door and rang the bell. A maid answered, Miss Van Dam? Yes, she lived there, but at that moment she was with her family in Alkmaar. <laughs> Alkmaar? All my studied casualness left me, but there's no one at the house in Alkmaar. The windows are all boarded up and the garden's been let go, and attracted by the sounds of distress, a white-haired lady appeared in the hall behind the maid. Gently she told me that Corey's father was seriously ill and she had gone to take care of him. The family had moved from their house to an apartment in which there would be no stairs to climb. She gave me the address. For the next few days, I suffered through my appointments in the tiresome town of Harlem. <laughs> How glad I now was that I'd always spent a few minutes talking with Mr. Van Dam those evenings we were in his home. What could be more natural than for me to pay him a visit? And so a few nights later, I was standing outside the Van Dam apartment in Alkmaar knocking on the door. Corey opened it. The light behind her turned her hair to gold. I've come to ask about your father, I said faintly. The pretext could not have fooled a three-year-old. <laughs> but Corey led me gravely back to her father's room. Mr. Van Dam was very ill. I could see it even from the doorway. But he seemed delighted to have a visitor. And so for an hour I sat in a chair beside his bed and told him about my trips behind the Iron Curtain and my hopes for the future while Corey came and went with bottles of trays, and I tried to keep my eyes from following her. She was wearing a nurse's uniform and seemed to me even more heavenly and unattainable than she had been in my dreams. And so began a curious, fumbling courtship. Twice a week I called on Mr. Van Dam. Twice a week Corey and I held hushed sick room conversations at the front door. Oftener than that I felt I would be intruding on the home pre preoccupied with its problem. Between visits, I would often try to imagine myself proposing to Corey, and it sounded so awful that I knew ahead of time it was no use. Please marry me. I'll be gone much of the time, and I won't be able to give you an address where you can write to me. And weeks will go by when I can't get letters out to you, and though we'll be in missionary work, you'll never be able to talk about the places and people we're working with. And if one time I shouldn't come back, you probably never will know what happened. Add to that, no foreseeable income, a room over a tool shed for a home. Corey was just too smart as well as too pretty to settle for a life like that. And it was October 20th, during the time I was making these semi-weekly visits, that the letter came from the Hungarian consulate. My request for a visa, dated a week after the revolt, had been approved. And suddenly I knew how I would go about asking Corey to marry me. I would ask her then that week, that very day, but I wouldn't let her answer until I got back from Hungary. That way, supposing she even considered the proposal, she'd have a chance to taste this brand of marriage ahead of time, and with the separation, the secrecy, and the uncertainty. Face it, Andy, I said to myself, the plain wretchedness of it. <laughs> but now I had a plan, and my heart couldn't help leaping for hope. I jumped into the car and covered the distance to Alkmaar in record time. I pounded on the door, forgetting for a moment the sick man inside. They were taking an awfully long time answering. I was lifting my hand to knock again when the door opened and one look at Corey's face and I knew. Your father? She nodded, half an hour ago. Talking was obviously a struggle. The doctor's here now. And so I drove back to Vita with my proposal still burning inside me. 
Except at the funeral, I didn't see Corey for three weeks. I spent that time buying, buying or begging every Hungarian language Bible in Holland, which wasn't many, and stowing them along with a supply of Hungarian tracts in the car. At last, one beautiful moonlit night, I asked Corey to come for a ride with me. We spun along a broad dike until our headlights picked out a smaller road leading off to the right. I swung down it and stopped. The moon gleamed up at us from the canal at our feet, and the setting was perfect. And I began everything all wrong. Corey and I began, I want you to marry me, but don't say no until you tell, I tell you how hard it will be. <laughs> hard for me and harder for you. And then I outlined for her the work that I believed God had given me. I told her the next month would be a fair sample of the life ahead for me and for her if she chose it. You'd be crazy too, Corey, I finished miserably, but I do so want you to. <laughs> Corey's enormous eyes were bigger still when I had finished. She opened her mouth to speak, but I laid my hand on it. When I left her at her apartment, I had her promise she would give me my answer when I returned from Hungary. I'm going to leave it right there. Yep. No, don't do that. You can leave it right there until next time. Right? Well, we've got to hear about his trip to Hungary anyway. <coughs> This is a good place to <laughs> Isn't that awful? Tune in next time to hear what happens. Yeah. If you really and want you to look at the book on Amazon, it's not very expensive. The whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it great when a story is so good you just can't wait for the rest of it? <laughs> Particularly uh, a human interest story like that. Mm. With uh, a young couple. Seeing how we've got that. some young couples. You'd be crazy to say you say yes, but don't say no until you know what to do. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Well, it almost sounds like, you know, the way he's writing it, that it's going to go through. Okay. We'll wait and see. Well, you know, he was in love with that other girl, Tilly. Yeah, he he well. thought she was going to marry him, but she didn't. Tilly, she did not. <laughs> Okay, so I mean that's what, uh, of course that's what we're talking about, that's what Christianity is, it's a love story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It really is. <clears throat> One that we uh, have a very dim understanding of. So. Well, wait a minute now, can you picture <clears throat> Jesus saying the same thing he just said? About becoming his, about becoming his bride? Yeah. You're crazy if you do, it's going to be hard. Yeah. <laughs> It's but fun. it'll be worth it. But it'll be worth it. That's mm -hmm. right. The rest of the chapter is about as long as what I just read, so it'll yeah. be a good one for next time. Okay. <laughs> All right, so where did we end up last week? Matthew we're five, son. Matthew chapter 5. And, <laughs> of course, we're talking, uh, those of you that know that, the chapter, the chapter of the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount, I think sometimes. I think we're at 13 on <clears throat> We stopped at verse 11 there. Did we? Um, I wanted to, I mean, when we went through the first ten verses there, we're looking at, just to remind you that we're looking at very foundational principles, aren't we? <clears throat> you know, Jesus is uh, kind of just getting rolling, getting started with his earthly ministry. And he's, uh, <clears throat> why, why do you think it's important for him to be laying out a lot of these foundational principles? Foundation. Well, because it's the foundation, right? <clears throat> anything. anything else? What What was uh, some of the reaction that we we Are you familiar with any of the reactions from the people concerning his teachings? What are some of the reactions? Now, now the people themselves accepted it. The people. <clears throat> It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees and them that, that uh, was the ones pitching a fit and caused him all the heartache and grief. Okay, but the yeah. ordinary person accepted him. Okay, to, 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 to a certain degree I think we could say that's probably true. Although they were probably, uh, there, I think there's one passage where it talks about how they marveled at his teaching. You know, why would, why would they have marveled at his teaching? Because he taught like like no other. The priest, the Sadducees, none of them talked the way he talked. Even even the guards of the priest, of the high priest, they said, we have never in our life heard anybody teach like this. So, 
<clears throat> so he he's coming along as a, a rabbi, and you would think that he would be his message would be consistent with the other rabbis, but it's not, is it? No. Okay. It's in fact it's almost the complete opposite in a lot of ways of what the people were used to getting. You know, they're used to getting a, a steady diet of certain spiritual food, and all of a sudden here's this other message that's coming. You know? So it's very different. And so they were uh, a little bit taken by that. And of course, the what happens if what happens if you come along and you're teaching something different than the status quo? Then you're in the wrong. You'll definitely get noticed. People get uncomfortable. People get really uncomfortable with that. And uh, and you can't be right because. And you can't be right because if you're a single voice standing up mm -hmm. proclaiming something, and everybody else is. Teaching something, teaching different. something different. Well, that's what the priest said when he was 12 years old in, at the temple. Right. Yeah. The priest said, how did he know these things? He didn't go to our schools. We didn't teach him this. But he was about his father's business. Mm -hmm. He had direct communication with his father. <clears throat> and I think it had a lot to do with his early childhood, his mother his mother training him, and his, his, his father teaching him the scriptures. I think he had mm -hmm. a really good foundation in mm -hmm. the home. Mm -hmm. So if what we reviewed last week uh, with the uh, particular first ten verses there, if that was more of the foundational of a message from God, then what, what were the teachers in Israel presenting? What were they teach what were they talking about? Cunningly devised fables. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only phrase that came to mind when you asked. <laughs> okay. The traditions of men. The traditions, the traditions yeah. of men. Mm. Their own interpretations. Yeah. Their own what had, yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe maybe their own hidden agendas. I mean oh. if God had given them Tim God had given them the law, mm -hmm. right? And of course you hear the, the expression today, uh, you know, they had the Torah. What was what's the Torah? The first, the first five, five books, books of, of the okay. Old Testament. The books of the Law and the mm -hmm. Prophets, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but of course, by the time you get to Jesus, these ten principles have become what? Uh, Suggestions. Well, not only that, but then it's also become how many? Five hundred some laws. Six hundred thirteen. Yeah, mm -hmm. different laws. Yeah, really yeah. complicated. <laughs> And just to give you a little asterisk next to that number there, um, the reason they ended up with 613 is because they had, they believed they had to have a law for every day of the year. So they had 365 um, it, it, particular laws, right? And then they had a couple of hundred additional ones. But they always had them divided up pro and con. They had positive and negative laws. And that's why they ended up with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these laws. <clears throat> they, uh, uh, we call it, we call that today micromanaging. <laughs> you know, if you ever go to work for somebody and they try to micromanage you, you won't stay there very long. You won't stay there very long. Well, and also the priests back then, the majority of them were thieves to start with. Because they took with us homes and, it, I mean, you know, they Oh, yeah, just, they were... You know, they, uh, they were thieves. That's what they were. Yeah. But at the same time, they had lots of deficiencies of character. Yeah. What was the pretense that they were trying to portray? That they knew more than anybody else. Well, not uh, yeah, older that, than that. That, that, and that. Yeah. What was all it? those. But so Jesus referred to them as whitewashed sepulchers. Whitewashed sepulchers. Yeah. Bunch Whitewash. of graves full of dead men's bones, and they got pretty yeah. on the outside and dead and We're the know-it-alls, and we're the holy ones. You know, so, so be like us, right? And actually there was a sentiment um, in Israel that uh, from the average person that, wow, if you could just be like the rabbis, you would have it made. What did Larry you know? say? What did you say about the Jewish They were thieves. Oh. Yeah. And they, and they and were they, holier than this air of, of piety and... Mm -hmm. sacredness and stuff like that. When you consider the, the rich young ruler and 
his approach to Jesus, and Jesus told him, you know, he needed to keep the law. He said, I've kept the law perfectly from my youth. If he'd known anything about the law, he would know he didn't know he hasn't kept it. He couldn't keep it. They were looking at the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law, right? <clears throat> spirit of the law. Can you sit with me? Now, with that, with that in mind, I wanted to just uh, revisit verse 11 and 12 before we actually moved on. <clears throat> Look at verse 11 and 12 for a minute. Because this is, this is actually an important consideration. You know, um, Jesus is giving them, you know, blessed, 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 blessed in the preceding verses. And then he's going to say, blessed are you when, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. That seemed a little unusual no, to you. No, why not? Well, I want to do that. So when you get that doesn't get, seem like no blessing to me. When you get maligned and you get uh, misconstrued and they try to make you out to be an evil person and yeah. etc. Yeah. And they they lie about you, misrepresent you. You are to rejoice and be not just glad. Well, exceedingly glad. Well, there where it says, "Blessed are you when men shall revile you." That revile means to hate. Right. When men hate you. Yeah, yeah. Why in the world would I don't consider it a blessing? But no man. So, of course, the reason I'm bringing this up because I want to talk about this. Um, uh, not only is not a blessing. Yeah. Not only um, how can you rejoice? First of all, um, well, first of all, what what we have to understand is that <clears throat> there's there's no sense in trying to be obscure and kind of stay hidden so that so that you're not persecuted. The scripture is very clear. In many, especially throughout the New Testament, Paul predict. I mean, it almost seems like Paul went around looking for trouble. I mean, when you start really getting into it, but really he 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 really didn't. What was happening in his life? I mean, why, why was he usually in a lot of trouble? Out of his big mouth. <laughs> because he was out there promoting the kingdom of God. Okay, and he was out there promoting truth. He promoted the kingdom of God when he was living in the kingdom of Caesar. There you go. And okay. Caesar claimed to be God and was worshipped by the people as God. So when you okay. claimed you had another God, you were at odds with the government. Then he found out as a Christian, you're at odds with the Jews. They couldn't make anybody happy in that day and age. Exactly. Well, exactly. Okay, exactly. So, so there were a lot, a lot of things working against uh, a proponent of the truth. But he was set on fire, in, in a sense, a spiritual sense, to to promote the truth, to to actually promote the light. Okay. But isn't this going to be the exact same thing for the last day generation? Mm -hmm. This is exactly... Hasn't this actually been the case for all of God's people through all time? Uh-huh. But especially here coming up on the last... In, in the, the last days here? And, and why would it, be, would, would it be more severe at the end? Because at the end time, it's going to really be severe. Because it is the end. That's right, and that's what, that's an important consideration that we talked about for a while. Scripture says the devil walked as well as a roaring lion, <clears throat> yeah. seeking whom he may devour. And he may not devour me. He knows that his days are numbered, so. Mm -hmm. Right, but he can also count, so he can also he also recognizes the time is short. That's what it says mm -hmm. in Revelation 12. Mm -hmm. All right, Revelation chapter 12. He knows he has a short time, mm -hmm. so he has to to intensify his efforts to. To eliminate, to eliminate anyone who is promoting light and truth, darkness. as opposed to darkness. Okay? So, <clears throat> um, just a couple of scriptures I can share with you on this. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 6.14, um, that's a scripture that talks about, you know, what communion has light with darkness. Okay. And we're talking about the Pharisees here, and we're talking about, because, you know, 
I think about this for, for just a second. Almost all the resistance that Jesus ended up getting from his ministry, where, what was the source of it? Who did it come from? From within. Jesus Christ. Actually. It came from the church. Yes. God's people. Mm -hmm. His right? church. The church. His church. Yeah, his church. Almost, I mean, he came to his own and his own received, received him, him not. And what did they do to him? They eventually put him up on a cross. Yeah. Right? They eventually killed him. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, uh, and of course, uh, if you read through the early Gospels and so forth, you'll find out that even from his birth, that was the beginning of the process where they, they started to develop this uh, agitation and this resistance. Uh, because of their preconceived expectation, right, of, of how the Messiah would come and, and who the Messiah would be. And then when this poor, you know, Galilean, you know, woodworker guy shows up, you know, from, the, from Joseph's uh, shop, they're like, who are you? You know, you don't look like a Messiah. You, you know, you're not what, what we've been told to expect. Etc. Etc. And so, and of course, during that time, you also had false messiahs. You know, Barabbas was a false messiah. There were multitudes of, of zealots, multitudes of zealots claiming to be the messiah. So, they had all that to deal with. But here comes the real McCoy. Here comes the one who is the the, the source of all light and truth. And the church response is. We've got to suppress this. We've got to mm -hmm. subdue this. We've got to get rid of this, right? Yeah, they didn't come in the church like they wanted. There was, yeah, the expectation was there. Okay, wait a minute now. Was it really, so now, was it really their fault <laughs> that they didn't accept him? Well, you know, they had the scriptures right there. Yes. They just missed. Right okay, up. wait a minute now. Wait a minute now. Absolutely so. Wait a minute now. Was it really their fault? That they didn't accept him when he says, I am the Messiah. There was no proof that he was the Messiah. Yeah, what were you say? Not yet. What were you going to say, Kim? Did you slip your mind? I, I missed it. Oh, you were, you were commenting and I kind of cut you off there a little bit. Oh, that's all right. No, it is. <laughs> okay. It was their fault. Well say. <laughs> Because you're accountable for the knowledge that you <coughs> know or yourself. could have known. Right. And they had the scriptures available to them, but they were content to let the priests and the yes. rabbis... No, I'm, not the about, I'm not talking about the priests. I'm not talking about, I'm talking the, about the people. The people. I'm saying the people yeah. were content to let the priests and rabbis interpret scripture for them instead of studying for themselves. Who yeah. were the ones who were studying for themselves and looking for the Messiah the night that he was That's born? the reason they wouldn't accept him. It was the Messiah. Yeah. It was the shepherds because out on the hillside. The, the, the uneducated, illiterate shepherds were the ones who were studying Scripture. Mm -hmm. The priests and rabbis had no idea he'd been born. And the people were following the priest. They was expecting uh, the, the priest to tell them exactly when he come and who he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, they wouldn't accept the, him coming uh, the way he did. Sure. So is it, would it be unusual, and of course uh, we just mentioned at the end time particularly, is it unusual that anyone promoting light and truth, it, would it be unusual for them, and, and would it not be expected for them to, to be persecuted? Oh, we're definitely going to be persecuted. Okay. Yeah. All right, so <clears throat> that, sure. that, that's just going to come with the equation. Uh, with the territory, that it's something right. that uh, so, so. See, the disciples were nothing more than examples for us as to what we're going to go through. Mm. Right. Exactly. That's if that's something that's normally going to come, that's a normal process of what it means. In other words, being Christian means that you are in opposition to darkness. Okay. Now, what percentage of the world is in darkness? Ninety percent of it. Okay, it's way, it's way, way up there, right? Mm -hmm. It's got to be ninety plus percent yeah. of the world is in darkness. You, you, you watch when Satan comes. How quick people jump on him, following to follow, of course. And it's, 
and it's probably going to be the opposite of the way it was whenever Jesus comes. Yeah. What's the first been, reaction if you've been asleep and somebody turns the light on? That's right. And you've been in darkness. What's the first reaction? They're going to be startled. Right. They're going to listen. But you get you get startled and fever. you're covering your eyes. You don't want that bright light shining right. in your face. But he, but people are going to be deceived by Satan. <clears throat> Satan is yeah. the deceiver, and he can, he can present himself. He can quote the Bible, but he trembles, and he knows God, too. But he's going to deceive people, and they're going to follow How is he going to deceive them? By quoting, by pretending like he has the but, light. But, well, but, he'll be but able to quote else? scripture, that for sure. See, Satan doesn't come until the fourth season. So, what's going to happen is this... Yep. The, what's going to happen is there's this earth is going to be totally in an uproar. The, I'm, now, don't quote me on this, okay? But I'm look. this is what I'm seeing. A couple of asteroids or something other hit the earth. Just, just put it all in disarray. Just tear it all to pieces. Everybody, no food, because one third of the, one third of the food is gone. All the ash and everything else is going to cover the sun, the moon, and well, the stars going to, yeah, you know, so you can't grow nothing. And then here Satan comes up. He says, look, I can take care of this. I am Christ. I can take care of this. I can make this thing right. Well, Everybody's going to flock, flock around him. Yeah, because they have lost hope and they want hope. Well, there ain't no hope. But there they, is no hope. But they don't know that. Right, but he what I'm saying is there talking. is no hope. And these people look right. at him and say, hey, you're that's Christ. He's come. It's easy for him to but deceive them. That's what I mean. Right, one, one thing wrong just as that's happening, he's going to be here on earth. Uh, as that's happening, those who know better, what are we saying? Say this is the We're saying this the that way he's going to come. not the Messiah. That's, that's not right. the way he's going to come. That's right. That's not what the Bible says. No. Nope. But again, we're trying to talk to people and convince people that really don't want any part of what you have. They don't want any part of light because they're looking out for number one, right? Now he can he see what happened when he comes. He'll come personally in Christ, and he'll be allowed to accept in one thing. He cannot come as Christ comes. Sure. Now, how will we know that 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 it's not really Christ? If he's walking around on <coughs> this earth, he's not touching Christ. The ground. Yeah. If he's touching this ground, he is not Christ. Mm -hmm. Very important. Yeah, you That's know, your one number one thing to look for. One thing about it, you know, I mean, he. If you go back in the Bible, there unless Jesus is changed it. Yes, Satan went it. from here back to heaven, you know, and talked to him up there, then come back, you know, because, you know, he said that uh, uh, Jesus asked him, where have you been? He said, I've been on the earth, walking back and forth in the earth, you know, but yet he's able to go back up there. But Is that over with? Can he... Uh, still go back and forth? I don't believe he has access no. any longer. No. Not after the cross. Yeah, not after that. So. After the cross, that was it. That right there sealed his doom right there. Okay. Period. So even before the Lord comes, which will uh, be a very pivotal moment um, where light intervenes amidst darkness, um, obviously we've got some time just before that happens where. Uh, we're going to be in, in a difficult situation. We're going to be persecuted. That's just going to come. If we're willing to stand for, for truth, if we're willing to <clears throat> be a light and we're willing to be salt, as, as we're going to get to uh, here in a little bit, as he's talking about here, we are going to experience resistance. Okay? And resistance that's going to be difficult, it's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be devastating. Um, there'll be lots of lots of believers that end up being martyred. It will cost them their very lives to stand for truth. Now, this is right before the close probation. Before probation closes. Okay. okay. How can we <clears throat> consider that an exceedingly joyful experience? Because. With truth, the only there is thing peace. Is. Just a bit. With truth, there is peace. And with the faith in knowing God's promises, 
faith is greater than hope, and faith does encompass hope, and the patience of the saints, we will know not to get caught up in the crowds and the false. We will recognize and be able to discern through the Holy Spirit what is truth and what is not of truth. And we can have that assurance that God will be taking care of us and God has a plan and God has a plan for us and all of us. Okay, Kate. Yeah, it, it says that our food and everything will be sure, mm -hmm. but if you don't know any of the scriptures, you will be deceived by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because the word. This is the, the word main is thing part, right there. Yeah. We'll be following every know the false scriptures. doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. We have to know the scriptures and know that no. God is in control. So, no, know and accept it. That's Even it. Satan knows. We got to know and accept. I know. You're we right. We have to accept it. We have to have the faith and the belief and have the you, patience. Have you ever heard um, someone, you're chatting with someone and lots of difficulties are coming their way and they look up to you and they say man all these things are, are, are happening I know however that I'm on the right track mm -hmm. in other words if if the natural if what the scripture says is true that those who, who promote the light those who follow truth shall suffer persecution. Mm -hmm. As persecution comes, what does that tell you? That you are on the right track. The right you track. are doing the right thing. You are it's almost it's almost a way of God guaranteeing that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Right? And we are not that you're not that you're happy that you're okay. suffering, right? But you're you're exceedingly joyful you that you are in the will of God, accomplishing accomplishing this, what God has. God has simply asked us, right, to lift Him up, right? Yes. Right. And as we lift Him up for the world to consider, we're, we're pointing and saying, look, look to Jesus. He's the source of salvation. Well, darkness doesn't want to look to Jesus. No. They want to look to self, right? Right. Okay. So, as we experience persecution, that's, that's almost a confirmation that we are following in the will of God, accomplishing what He intended for us to accomplish. And so we can, we can be joyful, exceedingly joyful, in that, that we are in His will. As long as we continue to be in His will, okay. and that will take belief and faith and patience. Because right. when things are going bad, and, and we know that God, and we believe mm -hmm. it, God has a plan for all of us, and if we continue to follow Him, our, we will be given the gift of that patience. It's the patience of the saints. And patience will not allow us to crumble when all heck is breaking loose around us, and everybody right. is being chaos and losing their heads. The patience that God will give us and the peace will pass with all understanding to keep us calm amidst all of that chaotic that people can get so caught up in because that's all of Satan. It's perspective. All that chaos. Isn't it? It's perspective. Yes. He There's an old saying. He, he won't a... uh, keep us, deliver us from it, but he'll help us through it. He will always help us through it, whether it's an illness. Or the chaos of even sitting in a traffic jam or a weather situation. There's, there's an old saying that says, if you haven't met Satan today, it's probably because you're going the same way he's going. In other <laughs> words, in other words, if you don't have adversity today, right. it's because you're going in the wrong direction. Yeah. If you don't have adversity in your life, then, then you're, there's something wrong. You're not going the right direction. Right. Or Same thing I was saying. You, know, you, you, you know you're on the right track when you get when you're being persecuted and you're in, because if you faint, what? if you faint in in, in troubles, right. in Proverbs, if you, if you do in, a, then your faith is small. If, if you, you do a, troubles. sure. If you do a study on light and darkness, you'll find some interesting uh, tidbits out there. Um, 
Psalm 112, verse 4, Psalm 5, and verse 20. I mean, Isaiah 5, 20. What was the Psalm what? Psalm 112 and verse 4. You can look some of these up later. Uh, really talk about when a person is converted, they pass from darkness to light. light. Okay? Darkness can't dwell with light. Okay? They're, they're, they're the, one is the antithesis of the other. One's the opposite of the other. The unconverted... This is uh, John 3.19. The unconverted prefer darkness. Okay? What, is, what do the converted prefer? Light. They, confer, they prefer the light. Okay? That's John 8.12. So these are just scriptures that I'm throwing out there. Uh, Micah 7.8 you can put down. Also Matthew 4.16, which is uh, one that uh, we looked at uh, a, little, a little while ago. Um, John what's, one, what's, pardon me? John chapter 1 verse 5. Yeah. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness comes Darkness. Down. Right, exactly. So, if someone wants to remain in darkness, that's of course, it's a, it becomes a choice, right? The reason that yes. you have light and dark, and, and God uses those things to, to really illustrate truth and error. In fact, he... he I, I think that the whole thing is set up, even our, even the creation was set up mm -hmm. with light and dark to help us recognize that there's something that, there, that there's a choice. We can choose one or the other. Mm -hmm. okay? We can walk in one direction or the other direction. Okay? We can embrace one or the other. And you can't have them both. A lot of people, you know, try to fence it. They try to... Mm -hmm. um, Play, uh, play both sides, but it's not going to be possible. Yeah. Not going to be possible. It's interesting that you have an organization out there called the Illuminati, and I know, you know, for a long time people have been uh, talking about the secret societies and things of that nature. Um, and the Illuminati was started quite a while back, hundreds of years ago, at Wysop. But what does the word Illuminati mean? To okay, it means the illuminated ones. Okay, um, uh, <laughs> the, those who walk in the light. And of course, Lucifer, his name means light bearer. Light bearer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's just interesting that the light bearer became the source of darkness. Mm -hmm. you know? Kind of, kind of interesting when you start piecing it all together. But you've got an organization out there today that's had hundreds of years in development um, that claims to, to, to be the illuminated ones. And know, yet they and are yet underground they are and steeped in secrecy. In total darkness. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. It's interesting how uh, you know, the world has been played. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says that the world calls darkness... Light, light, light darkness. and light, darkness. Okay, so you can see how all this stuff fits together, and how how uh, um, the world is in a deplorable circumstance when it comes to understanding what truth is. And we have to we have to say from the example that we're looking at here, even with what Christ was dealing with with his own church when he was here, they were steeped in darkness as well. He was coming, his coming, one of his primary missions was to try to help them to see the light, help them to embrace the light, right? And of course they rejected that, didn't they? Um, because they, they, they thought they already had the covenant component, which they had one of them, but they didn't have both of them. And uh, that's, that's one of the things that <clears throat> kind of got them going in the wrong direection. At the end, wrong will seem right, and right will seem wrong. Exactly. And that is going on right now. That's exactly oh, right. absolutely. Oh, yeah. I That's mean, exactly big right. time. Absolutely. Yes, in this country, with these laws yeah. that are passed are an abomination to God's word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, evil is good and good is evil. Well, I mean, the whole thing has been flipped around, turned inside out and upside down. Okay? And unfortunately, a lot of people are going along with that. Mm -hmm. So when you come along, when I come along, and try to say not so fast, you know that that you call good is really not evil. Good, according that to that you call evil is good, mm -hmm. 
you know, this is the light over here, not over there. See, so immediately um, we're gonna we're gonna people, rub people. Yeah, the people wrong way. don't want to hear that. And particularly if the masses, if the masses of people are going in a certain direction, what does the Bible say? To go the other way. Run no, the no, other no, way. No. Run the other way, right? But according but, to this, but what I've been seeing in this country is there are situations where the masses are not going in a direction that we, we know, are wrong. There's only 1% or less than 1% of our whole total population of the United States of America that's going in a direction that is a clear abomination to the Lord, but yet we have a law now in this country that we have to all live by and accept when it's not the masses. It's 1% or less. So we have to know this too, and we have to be aware. It's not about all the numbers. It's about what we know to be the truth of the light of God's Word sure. and what is the darkness and the deceiver and the destroyer. Because w this country will be destroyed if it continues to follow in what this country believes is truth and light and what is right. When we know what the abomination of the Lord's are, and it says it in God's Word. Right. The masses have been conditioned over hundreds of years, actually, to move in the direction that they're currently moving in. Um, the one percenters are the ones that are leading out and with with uh, driving the masses in a certain direction, and it's because the people have been conditioned to accept certain things and to be led as lambs to the slaughter. We could say there's a hidden agenda yeah. going on. Yeah, it's very clear. <clears throat> let me uh, let me share some things uh, uh, on this particular chapter in the Sermon on the Mount that I thought were kind of appropriate. Um, it just says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Um, you know, it's one thing to stand up for your family name, for your reputation. Um, those things could be important, etc. It's important to stand up for somebody else that you see being persecuted, you know? It says it in God's Word. Right. Okay. But the most important thing, I think, is to stand up for righteousness' sake. Mm -hmm. To stand up because it is right. Um, and uh, no matter, you see, a Christian can have the perspective, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what's right, I'm going to say what's right because it is right, because God presented it as, as light and truth. It doesn't make any difference how you think of it or the masses of people think about it it's right because God said it was right okay it's the same thing like for example with the Sabbath you know that most of the world they disregard the commandment to rem remember the Sabbath I don't really care what the rest of the world says the only should I said remember right I, I shouldn't care what the rest of the world says because God has said it God has stated yeah. it <clears throat> and that's what becomes important okay right. So it doesn't make any difference what culture says, what the masses say, what what the illumin what the educated people say. It doesn't make any difference what any of that's it's important only what God says. Okay. <clears throat> okay, it says um, it also says rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. It says and then he adds on, for so they persecuted the prophets which were before you. Um, <clears throat> You know, to be a prophet, particularly in the Old Testament, was a dangerous undertaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, you definitely wanted to feel like you were called to that position because you, God was going to speak through you and God was going to tell you, go and tell this group, this, this leadership, this yeah. king, whoever, <laughs> go and tell them, reprove them, yeah. tell them they're going in the wrong direction. Yeah. Does, that, does that make you very popular? When you no. go and tell people you're wrong, you're sinning. Uh, I mean, is it very popular? Is it politically correct to go and say, we shouldn't have gays marrying one another? That's, but that's God always told those prophets, I will be <clears throat> with you. I will not leave you. I will give you the words. And what happened to many of them? They were all executed. They were executed. They were killed. 
Okay? Same thing will happen to God's people at the end. God's people will stand up. Many will be martyred for their faith. Okay? Is, is, um, is that a life being wasted? Why, isn't, why, why is that a life being wasted? I guess they're like being saved. It is. Mm -hmm. Why? It's it's not right. I mean, it, 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 couldn't Satan say, hey, I'm gaining the truth because I'm, I'm silencing that voice right there. No longer will that person have a voice. What, what's, what's happening with when person a person's mark? standing up for God. <laughs> no, that's true. That individual is silenced, right. but there's ten more that Christ right. said. Okay, mm -hmm. the, the God knows the that, seed has that been dedication. planted. <clears throat> when it gets watered, God will take care of the harvest. Right. Yeah. It says here, the world loves sin and hates righteousness. Mm -hmm. Righteousness means rightness. Right doing. Yeah, and this was the cause mm -hmm. of its hostility to Jesus. And this will also be the cause of the hostility to anyone who follows his example. Okay? All who refuse his infinite love will find Christianity a disturbing element. So, it's a disturbing element already. Okay, so God is trying to reveal to the world his great love for them. His great love for us. Okay? We should be mirroring that. We should be reflecting that attitude. We should be demonstrating and revealing to the world an attitude of the sacrifice that God made. Our, our love as well. Right? <clears throat> so that becomes a disturbing element to, to those around you. The light of Christ sweeps away the darkness that covers their sins. And the need of reform is made manifest. <clears throat> now listen, while those who yield to the influence of the Holy Spirit begin war with themselves, those who cling <coughs> to sin war against the truth and its representatives. That's a, that's a statement that we talked about last week. Mm -hmm. To be at war with self, right, is at peace with God, right, and to be <clears throat> at war with God is to be at peace with self. That's really what it's saying here. While those who yield to the influence of the Holy Spirit begin war with themselves, those who cling to sin war against the truth and its representatives. Um, we got to remember the... the um, We're talking about the cardinal. This is, this, is, this, is the, this is the divide between light and darkness right here. Okay? If you're at war with self, you're at peace with God, you're following the light. Mm -hmm. right? If you're at war with God and peace with self, then you're in darkness. What does it mean to be at war with self? What does self represent? What do you think? Self represents what? Your fight against sin. What this cardinal nature of man. The natural. The natural cardinal, cardinal nature. nature of man. Right. It's the arrogance, it's me, 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 it's selfishness, it's self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. It's yeah. exactly what Lucifer became. Mm -hmm. Self-centered, self-absorbed, self-focused. Yeah. See, Hard once he nature. became, once he was so focused on self, he then became at war with his creator. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So this all happened, this, is, this originated in heaven. He yeah. was really struck on himself. He like was, was above was. everybody else. That's it. Arrogance, pride, mm -hmm. cardinal nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see the most high angel? Mm -hmm. Yes, he was, he was, he was one of the covering cherubs. Yes. One of the covering cherubs at the throne of God. He thought he was better than God. Okay, so no, strife is created. Strife, there's strife in this world because of a conflict between light and darkness. The follow, and Christ's followers are accused, of course, as being troublers of the people. Um, is that the desire of ages? Yeah, that's desire of ages. This is all Sermon on the Mount stuff. What pages? And that's exactly the reason. That's uh, uh, 306. And that's exactly the reason, in the end times, right before the close of probation, that's exactly the reason Satan's going to bring them in, in the mentor of son of law, and then he's going to say, look here, right here are the troublemakers. If you get rid of them, I can get this place straight. 
Right. And they put that there for free on me. Okay, so amidst all that, and I mean, we've had difficulties, of course, along the way. I mean, as, as Christians, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've already experienced some of the persecuting aspects. You may, you may not have realized that you were being persecuted at the time, but you've already um, been persecuted. Um, I know Elijah's experienced that firsthand here recently. Okay? For, for talking out, for talking to others, for witnessing, for sharing, you know, you end up being inconvenienced, yes. You end up being, you know, talked about, accused, condemned. Well, you we'll know, be talked about persecuted. and accused for a lot of things, so right. it's a good thing that we're talked about and accused mm -hmm. for standing up for God sure. and witnessing. Right. If you're an ambassador for the kingdom, then you're an ambassador, ambassador for the kingdom. For the okay? kingdom. And so yeah. you're looking out for the best interest of, of um, God's kingdom. Um, every fiery trial is God's agent for our refining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, just like, just like, um, <clears throat> just like the world's been conditioned to so accept dark, right, to accept darkness, etc. <laughs> we need to be conditioned well, and prepared for what's coming at the end, particularly. Persecution not always bad. God, God. Persecution sometimes God even allows persecution in order to build you up. Well, we, if you don't exercise, that's it. then you then we, you're not going to have the strength. When we to stand. choose right. during our trials, <clears throat> during our refining trials, if we choose not to turn to God to help us through it, then we are turning our back on God because God is there wanting us to come to Him. He will refine us. He will fine-tune us. He will strengthen us. He's our comforter. Right. In, in every situation, <clears throat> um, no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what situation we're in, no matter how difficult it seems, okay, no matter how painful it yeah. becomes, doesn't Scripture tell us that all things work together, together for good to those that love God to those who have been called according to his purpose okay so if that means that a person would even have see we have to grow to the place and be conditioned to the place that we would even be willing if God knows if I became a martyr it would win ten other souls for the kingdom I should be willing to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we're and again, it's a matter of perspective. In the long run, mm -hmm. the perspective is if you're following the light, if you're one of the uh, a child of the light, you know where you're going to end up. You know the end That's of the story, right. and you know that God has the plan. God has the plan. You, you can't know the end from the beginning, but no. you have to trust the one but who does. God does. That's you right. That's what it is. That's what I mean. Okay, so. Now, he calls us a little, a little uh, further on in the chapter there. Right? He calls us the salt of the earth. Right? Yes. Verse 13. Yeah, verse 13. Yeah. You are the salt of the earth, and then a little further down, he calls us, in the next verse, he calls us the light of the world. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be the salt of the earth? What does salt do? Flavors. 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 Seasons. It's a, something that it binds together. It but it's a binding. Preserves. It's a binding substance. Mm -hmm. Salt. So salt has a lot of functions, right? Yeah, it does. There's white ice. And the salt oh, melts ice. Yeah, the salt yeah. is also needed. Clears the pathway. The salt is also needed to continue to melt ice on the walk. To allow our heart to beat. Yes. It's, it's, yeah. So I'm looking at it. <laughs> helps us to retain fluid. Yeah, it helps our heart beat. Yeah. If we didn't have salt, our heart. Right. Mm -hmm. so the sodium diet. Yeah. Sodium, right. So we are the salt of the earth. We are sure. God. God 
God is in our heart. Yeah. So it's are. interesting that we are the heartbeat of the planet. That's it. Okay. So in actuality, and that's where the blood is pumped. Okay, so so those that are walking in darkness, would find us <laughs> so distasteful. <laughs> there you go. Right? Maybe too salty. Right? Uh, and would love and would love to just use us for for melting snow. Right. To be thrown out underfoot. Right. To be thrown out underfoot. Right. The <laughs> they don't recognize that if it weren't for the Christians in this world. In other words, their very lives their very lives Depends. depend on the Christian influence in the world today. They don't even recognize that. If it weren't for that Christian influence, the world would have already been destroyed. Toast. What, it would have already what, been destroyed. What if, God took, what if God right this well, minute took every true Christian off the planet of the earth, took the Holy Spirit off, nothing is left except weakness. How long would this thing well, last? Well, see, that's the problem with the, the that's the problem with the secret rapture theory. One of the main problems with the secret rapture theory: if you pull all the Christians out of out of the harm's way, what are you left with? You're left with a world in total darkness. Total no darkness. And what happens? Chaos. put Satan has nobody else to. to it's just gone. To okay. influence, it's already right. Yeah. So the Christian the Christian uh, witness is really acting as a preserving agent mm -hmm. for the entire planet in a certain respect. Okay? And I know that that would be hard for, for somebody, you know, maybe somebody watching us or tuning in out there in Cyberland would say, oh man, that's a crock of you-know-what, that you, know that you guys are preserving the planet. But it's actually, actually true. It's no. absolutely true. Where would they be standing right today if there was no Christian here to, to cushion the waypoint? I love the way um, she puts it here in this chapter. It says, hearts that respond to the influence of the Holy Spirit are the channels through which God's blessing flows. Okay, God's blessings flow through channels of light. Mm -hmm. Not channels of darkness, channels of light. Okay, Were those who serve God removed from the earth, His Spirit withdrawn from among men, this world would be left to de desolation and destruction the fruit of Satan's dominion. Okay. And actually that's what occurs during the millennium. Right? Exactly. All of the Christians are gone. Exactly. Right? Are being pulled yes. up, taken mm -hmm. out up. Yes. And what happens to the world during the it during that period of effort? No Christian is here, the whole place is broken down. There's, There's no here either. The brightness of his coming. God's right. blessings flow through light, is that what she said? Yes. Mm -hmm. Total darkness. Total darkness. Though the wicked know it not, they owe even the blessings of this life to, to the, the presence, presence the in world. the world of God's people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. But she says here, but if Christians are such in name only, right, they are like the salt that has lost its savor. So it's lost its, you, you ever put, you know, season your food, you know, and you go to take a taste and... The salt has lost its saltiness. Yeah, you have yeah. to dust on a little more. <laughs> Good for nothing. Right? What I do. I mean okay. The next thing that Jesus talks about here is that not only are you salt, but you're light. You're the light of the world. In it's, the next verse. The city verse that is set on a hill cannot right. be hidden. 14. 15, 16. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before me, that they may see your good works and glorify who? The Father. The Father, which is. In That's heaven. really what it's all about. Yes. It's all about. I mean, the, the purpose for living a Christian life is really not for anybody to say, "Oh, isn't that a nice, respectable, upright citizen?" You know, and aren't they just a nice person? And, just being a good old person. Just being a good old boy. You know, the purpose for living the Christian lifestyle it's is to bring glory and honor to only one. But how powerful is light? How powerful is light? Mm -hmm. Well, now, it's now, concentrated whole, and very powerful. If this whole earth was completely and totally black, just totally black, 
one kitchen match struck could be seen a mile away. One kitchen match can be seen a mile yeah. away. Yeah, well, now, now, how, tell me now, with that one match against all this darkness, and yet it can be seen just the one. Well, listen, man, you look and you go out to you go out outdoor and look in the sky. And what do you see? <coughs> you see stars. You can only see stars when it's dark, oh, and they are light oh, yeah. years yeah. away. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah light. So during the day we see we just see one star. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. You see one star. Sometimes you see two. <laughs> so what does it mean to be the light of the world? Um, what was the Jewish in the time of Christ? What was the Jewish attitude? What was the the attitude that the Jews had? That they had the law, they had Abraham as their father, and they were guaranteed for a shoe in for heaven. Yeah, and too bad if you were a Gentile. You're lost. You're it's, lost. It's too bad for you. Well, you right? They used the law of Moses. Because we, you know, Abraham. we were the chosen people, not you. We were the chosen ones. God chose us. But He chose you for what? Yeah, what did He choose the gospel. What did He choose a nation for? Why did He choose a nation? Huh? Carry the gospel to be light and salt. And they were to always be the priests of the world, and they messed that. <laughs> the Jews thought to confine the benefits of salvation to their own nation. How, how could you have an attitude like that? Well, look at Seventh-day Adventists, the most huh? of them. Is it misunderstand the covenant? Well, most certainly. But I mean, but I mean, just from the standpoint of being a human being, how could you look at another human being and say, I mean, what, this is real. I mean, this is really. There's uh, no love toward. There's no charity, selfless love. It's all about them. But this it's is also Christ. predestination, isn't it? This is a, a pre type of predestination. I the was way born, they saw it. I, the way they saw it. I was born Jewish. Mm -hmm. So I'm in. You're out. You're, You're out. out. No, that's just part of it. That's a pride luck of the, way. You know, yeah, luck of the draw, draw or something. Yeah. I mean, that's just crazy. Yeah. But I mean, that, what they were doing, weren't, weren't, weren't they that's taking away? They wouldn't, take, they wouldn't give the, the, the Gentiles any information at all. And so what, what was the real sin there, Ken? The real uh, sin. You wasn't good enough. The real sin was I'm they taking. They wouldn't go in to a uh, Gentile because they uh, uncircumcised sin and didn't sin. believe. Right. So that I'm taking away your power to choose. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That that is that's barbaric. That is. I mean, that's worse than barbaric. It's control. To take away the power of choice. Yeah. But, right. You know, we are born. God gives us choice. Mm -hmm. I like uh, highlighted some of these things here. It says true character is not shaped from without and put on. It radiates from within. If we wish to direct others in the path of righteousness, the principles of righteousness must be enshrined in our own hearts. Our profession of faith may proclaim the theory of religion, but it is our practical piety that holds forth the word of truth. The constant life the holy conversation, the unswerving integrity, the active, benevolent spirit, I mean the spirit of wanting to give. Uh, incidentally, we, we practiced that this past week and you don't even know it. The godly example, these are the mediums through which light is conveyed to the world. Um, not everyone here realizes, and maybe I'll tell you later uh, off camera, because. Uh, but we, we made a donation to a family that was in need. Okay. So you guys were part of that. Didn't but you know? also came and helped me with my wood. That was the giving spirit. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, our lives have to testify to what's inside, right? Mama had a poem that says, "I am my neighbor's Bible." Mm -hmm. Sometimes the only thing that a person sees or knows about Christ is what they see in you. Yeah. So how are you going to betray Christ? It's the important thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. the Just important like thing. in um, in what is it, Second Corinthians chapter three, the love chapter, with um, hope, love, and charity, and the most important is charity. 
Corinthians 13. Right? Yeah. Charity means selfless love. Yeah, agape. Agape. Yes. Selfless love. You know, it's not an emotional feeling of love. It's a selfless love. To put your neighbor before yourself. To put someone else before you. Yeah. Let's take the last 10 minutes here and talk about, um, Jesus goes on to talk about the law here. It says in verse 17, do not think that I, he began to recognize as he's talking, the mm. Pharisees are listening, and he began to recognize uh, that they, you know, because his teaching seemed to be the antithesis of theirs, he knew that they would perceive his teaching to be heretical and against the law of God, okay? which... Uh, and this statement was directed to the Pharisees. And this, this next, verse 17 was directed to them, right? Did I think that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets? I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And of course, it goes all the way down. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, um, one jot, that word jot uh, in the Greek is the word iota. You ever hear people say, Yeah, one iota. One iota. Okay, <laughs> not one iota will be one. That. That's the Greek word for one jot here, okay? Uh, one jot or one tittle will in no wise, in no means, pass from the law to all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, For I say unto you, and he's talking to the, the Pharisees, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So, right. what's that? Right there. Oh. So let's talk a little bit. We have in our Christian community today many denominations that have pushed aside the law of God. Now, now why have they pushed it aside? Because, well, they it was because it's inconvenient. It's inconvenient, and they don't want to honor the Sabbath, the fourth in particular. So, particularly the fourth commandment is one they want. They want. To, they, they want to, they're willing to sacrifice all ten, basically, just to get rid of the inconvenience of the Sabbath. Okay. Again, it shows self. Very short. All thinking about self. Very short-sighted. Yeah. How could anybody read these verses that I just read and come to a conclusion that the law was unimportant? nailed to the cross, of no necessity in the Christian's life today. How could anybody, when Jesus is sitting right here saying, don't think that I've come here to destroy the law of the prophet. I, I've come to fulfill it. Okay? I've come, that word means to satisfy. I've come to satisfy the... Now how did, how did he satisfy the demands of the law? Well, the law the covers ever of your life and everybody else's that can come up. The Ten Commandments will cover everything. Right. So well, not only that, but the law and the death. Okay. So in other words, he he uh, he honored the law, his father's law, by obeying it. Okay. He was in. He was not. He was never under the condemnation of the law. Because he was always in compliance. If you're driving down the road and, and the speed limit is 60, and you're driving 55 to 60, the law doesn't condemn you. You're not under the condemnation of the law because you're in compliance with it. But you want to know nothing about that. Okay. But if you go 65, now the law condemns you, and you're subject to being maybe pulled over and given a ticket. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> now keep you, telling you that. <laughs> Larry has to always remind me about that. You need to be in compliance with the speed limit. And I keep telling him, it's just a suggestion, Larry. Yeah, right. It's a suggestion. It's all a, that's the attitude that many people have concerning God's it is. moral law. It's yeah. just a suggestion. Okay. Just a if recommendation. It's, if it's convenient, you know, I'll, I'll, well, I'll call Peter that the only one that doesn't matter anymore is the fourth one. Yeah. Right, which is the only one that says remember. Right, the only one that says remember. I hope God looks at me the way all them state troopers did at pulling me over and let me go. <laughs> that's, that's grace. <laughs> that's grace, right? 
whenever you get stopped at the way you hit the ground there and your attitude yeah. will go a long way in whatever time to get away. Okay. Um, let me just share a couple of paragraphs here. We've got just a few minutes here on, on the law. And, and actually, we could talk about the law for a whole, whole session, more than a session here. But um, it's important to remember the purpose of God's law and that it still has a purpose today in our lives because we're still growing. We're growing in grace. Okay? And since we're growing in grace, we need something that pushes us in the direction, right? Pushes us in the direction of Christ. And that's what the law does. The law is a, is a mirror. It pushes us and it tells us when our face is dirty. We don't pick up a rock and bust the mirror to clean our face, do we? And you pick up the rock and you use that to clean your face. Yeah, you pick up the rock and you knock your head a couple times saying, I need to... Yeah, wake up. Wake up, okay. David used a very strong expression, encouragement or kissing. Encouragement or kissing. very scratchy. Yeah. Like they used it to clean pots and pans. <clears throat> okay. In fact, Psalm, Psalm 19.7 uh, simply says this, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now that's in the present tense, which means that, that it's ongoing. It's an ongoing present tense application. So the law perfectly aids in converting the soul. Okay? Now a lot of people have a, um, a lot of people because of misunderstandings of what justification is and what sanctification is, they think that once I'm justified, that conversion process is totally over and finished. Is that is that what happens? Yeah. Is that I hope not. That's just the beginning, isn't it? That's why they call it the new birth. Right? You're a babe in the faith. Of, so it's the beginning process. It's not an end to anything. It's the beginning. And so there's a growth that has to be maturing and a, and a growing. And of course, the Bible calls it perfect. Uses the word perfection, but it means a maturing process taking place. And that's what they call sanctification. So, growing and so that conversion process that starts with justification, where God declares the sinner to be just because of Christ's right doing, then says, because of His right doing, you will have the power to grow and mature. Which is glorification. Okay, with sanctification. I mean, sanctification. But we're not going to have glorification until after we get heaven. At the moment, at the last trump, when this mortal puts on immortality, then that's glorification. Then you're, yeah, then you're glorified. Okay. But you have to be, you have to prepare for that moment. See, the problem is that, not the problem, but the, the, the situation becomes more sensitive when you have a group of people that are going to live through to see Jesus come. See, they're sealed, right? And they, so they have to be reflecting that character when he comes in this present condition. And remember, too, you can't jump from a sinner to glorification. There's a process. You've got to go through justification before you get to sanctification. You've got to do sanctification before you get to glorification. It's a process. Yeah. It all starts at, at what we would call the new birth experience. Right. Justification, sanctification. Uh, sanctification start. It all starts when you become um, born again. But it's the beginning. And it's a growth process. And so the law oh, wait is minute, wait minute. converting. It's a growth process. Does that mean if what if I mess up some more down the line? Well that's why we have a mediator. That's why we have So does that mean that I have to start all over again? Or does it mean that, that the Lord looked at me and said, Hey he's messed up but you gotta ask he's repenting so he just picks up from there and keeps coming. Yeah. You just have to ask for forgiveness only. See, none like, of us are going to be perfect it's, until it's like a, um, It's like, you know, the, our little grandson just came in here uh, a year ago. He wasn't running around like he's running around today. Right? He's got his wheels today. Right? He's really got his wheels. But a year ago, a year and a half ago, what was he doing? Crawling. He was crawling around. Okay? So he had to grow stronger. He had to mature. He, he had to uh, utilize the, the nutrition and the food that his mama was willing to give to him, and he had to utilize the rest 
and the sunlight and the water and all these natural things that God's given us in order for him to grow strong physically. The same thing that happens in the physical nature happens in the spiritual nature, the spiritual realm. You you start you're born and you're gonna you're gonna just like just like what Braun did, you know, he he pull himself up and, and try to pull himself up, but he'd fall down. Well, when he would fall down, I'd go over and just give him a kick and say, Man, what are you doing? Yeah. What's wrong with you? Man up. Man up, buddy. <laughs> you know? No, of course not, right? I'd yeah. help him up and pick him up. Gently. And love on him a little bit Gently. and kiss his little boo boos and stuff. Yeah. yeah, that's what happens, right? Mm -hmm. God's the same way. We make mistakes, he picks us back up, but. As we get older. He has an expectation, and particularly for those at the end. I mean, I fully expect that, you know, uh, Braun's going to be running around. He's going to trip and fall and whatnot. But I expect when he gets up to 5 or 10 or 15, 20 years old, he's probably not going to be falling and tripping around like, like he might when he's 2. We hope not. Because he's maturing and getting stronger, right? The same thing is true in the spiritual. Unfortunately, in the Christian community, there's almost this expectation that spiritually speaking, you're always going to be an infant. You're never going to grow up. You're never going to mature. You're always going to be, on the You're always going to be tripping and falling. What did Paul say right. though? He said, "Don't you think it's time you get off this milk, milk? Yeah. and yep. get into some solid some food? Meat. Some solid food, right? Yeah, into the meat." <clears throat> Second Peter chapter one. This is a text probably a lot of people don't want to hear or read. Uh, Second Peter one. Peter takes us right on, 2 Peter chapter 1, takes us right, he takes us right through to this very time. He says, uh, from verses 5 to 10, about growing in faith, growing in grace, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, etc. So you see this growing process taking place, this process of sanctification. For if these things are in you and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness. What, buddy? What are you doing? Crazy-looking guy. Kind of look like you. Kind of look like me? Yeah, nice. Put the glasses on. Look at the camera and wait to everybody. Say hi, everybody. Say hi, everybody out there. Well, that man is coming. Do this. Give him a little kiss. Go. They love you, everybody out there. Okay. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure for if you do these things, what things? I do. What are the things? What if we do these things? What are the things that we're supposed to do? We're supposed to add to faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge. Temperance. Temperance. Okay, so if we do those things, what's it say? If we do these things, you will never stumble. Is that what your Bible says? Uh-uh. No. So mine says that's what the, that's what the actual language it says you'll never fall, but mine says stumble. There's a big difference between stumbling and falling. Mm -hmm. okay. Stumble just means you can trip. Yeah, you can trip, but you're not going to fall. But if you are growing in grace and God is leading you on step by step, um, you are not going to be in a place where you're faltering. That's where God is leading. That's what that that's what will allow God Never to eventually fall. seal his people at the end because they are reflecting his character. They're in the ark of safety. And and he can end his mediation now because there are people that are reflecting his character. Only at the close of probation. Close of probation. Exactly. His light reveals all the stumbling blocks in your path. Right. Exactly. Should be a light the irony feet. is that you yourself is also a light my feet. <laughs> yes, yes, that's interesting. And verse 11 and 12 goes on to say, if we do all this thing, this process of justification into 
sanctification. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly right. into the, the everlasting Lord. kingdom right. of our Lord and Savior Jesus, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance yep. of these things, though ye may though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Now let's stop for a second. I hey, wanted to say just on. one second that this is exactly what happened with Noah's Ark. Okay? It wasn't it wasn't all of the things that they were doing that saved them. Right? It was it was God that saved them. In other words, because Noah cooperated in the building of the boat there was an entrance to go through. There was a door to go through. Okay? Mm -hmm. Just like Peter is saying here. Okay? Mm -hmm. If we do all those things, mm -hmm. there's an entrance that's supplied to us. That's just what you read. Mm -hmm. okay? The same thing happened with Noah. God gave him everything he needed, all the instruction, all the blueprints. He cooperated. He built the ship. God finally said, okay, it's time for you to be sealed. You, you've, you've followed all my instruction. Now it's time to be sealed. Probation is about to close. Go through the entrance that I've that that has been provided. Okay. God continued to. And God the closed the door. God yes. sealed them in. Because right? Noah was had was, gone through this process, and he was persecuted and reviled. He was. But same God, thing we were talking about. But he he went and obeyed and honored God's mm -hmm. law. And it says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Yeah. And that is in the end times. We are going to have to be able to remember. How are you going to do that? God will give us this. Not only that, but look, you uh -huh. can't remember something that ain't been put here. That's mm -hmm. right. You've got to yeah. take and You've know what read. the Word says in order for the Holy and Spirit be, to bring to your mind. And be if willing ain't nothing to there. follow God's Word. It's not just enough of knowing what God's Word says. It's a matter of living God's Word. But you see, you can't remember something that ain't been put there. That's it. That seed has to be planted and it has to be watered before the harvest can ever be gotten. Alright, so uh, we're going to have to close it off right there because we don't want Candy to get home too late and uh, be driving around... Uh, Floyd County in the dark. We don't want to make it too late for, for anybody. And we'll just pick it up from right there um, next week. But these are foundational principles that we're talking about. And unfortunately, the Christian church has, has embraced a lot of traditional things that have come down over the centuries that seem to uh, move away from some of these foundational principles, what, what real true Christianity is. And that's kind of where we're going to go with this next week. We're going to really get into to what it really means to be uh, Christian. A lot of people think they're Christian, but are they? Are they, are they proponents that are, they're, does their lifestyle live up to what Scripture reveals um, as being Christ-like? And, and um, Hopefully it'll just be a wake-up call for ourselves, first of all, and uh, for anybody else that, that, God, that God sends that, uh, that takes a look at what we're looking at. Because we definitely need a wake-up call in this world. We need to. It needs to become very real for us. We're, we're at a late hour and we can't afford to be playing around with uh, just going through a routine. Now, Ed and I was talking this past week. You know, now there's going to be a lot, a lot, a lot of super good people, super good people that are going to be lost. They're going to be lost simply because they don't know or they refuse to know. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, everybody's going to make that choice. Um, one way or another, they're going to make a choice for light or darkness. And the thing for us to do is to be steadfast, to pray, uh, and just pray that God would use us in any way and every way in the finishing of His great work.
So, uh, and of course, foremost is to be the right example. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, no, no other comments. Uh, let me invite you to bow your heads and go to the other prayer. Father, we want to thank you so much for the time that we've had to, to look at your word. The world seems uh, so far removed from your ideal. Certainly gone the other way. We know that the time is running out for us to shed the light of truth, not only in our families and our communities, but, but around the globe. But you have promised in your word that it will be done. That the grace that brings salvation will appear to every person. So some way, somehow, they will be able to uh, make a choice. And Father, we're just praying and, and, and lifting up all of our friends and loved ones particularly. Those that, that we might be closest to. <clears throat> that in some way, we might influence them for Jesus. That the Spirit of God would work through us, that the angels would work in cooperation with our humble efforts to lift up our Savior, that all might be drawn unto Him. So accomplish that in our lives this coming week. <clears throat> Arrange all those divine appointments that are necessary. And help us to always remember that all things do work together for good. Um, in every activity, we pray that uh, Your will will be accomplished. And we're thankful that we can serve a God who is in control and is coming back soon. We do pray and ask, Lord, that you would save us when you come. Call us up into that, uh, into, the, <clears throat> into the sky to meet you. And may friends and loved ones, those that we know and love, be with us as well. Bless us to this end. You, you brought us here also in safety. We pray, Lord, that you take us home in safety and that you will most certainly use us in the finishing of your great work. And bless, bless these little, little ones particularly, these little lambs. Uh, bless all the little children. And we ask these, these mercies in Jesus' wonderful name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay, and if you uh, have, are joining us online, we pray the Lord will bless your family as well and continue to work in your in your behalf and we'll look forward to we'll look forward to seeing you next week same time same place god bless